So Shoreditch is a really interesting area, isn't it? Because it's always been almost like a, you know, like a crossing point for so many people. Mm. It's like the centre of East London culture. Mm. It's like a place where artists and musicians notoriously would kind of congregate and make things happen. Mm. Uh, and now what we have is kind of like the property developers who've come and just wiped all of that out by buying up all the things, gentrifying, gentrifying mm. everything and building new buildings. Mm. Um, and so what have we got left? We've still got these walls, but, mm. you know, the culture's kind of been destroyed a little bit. Do you think that's a process that... Um Building developers and councils. Do, do you think they use graph and and the more c creative uh, communities <clears throat> to leverage that kind of behaviour? Absolutely. Killer killer podcast. Killer killer official dot com. Street culture TV. Instagram UK frontline. Beatbox created. Talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Yeah. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or essentials you need to be choose to be desires. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us and being here. Big shout out to all the sharers and carers. People have been clocking us from the jump and um, allowing us to get away with it. Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. Uh, inside the house today, Barry was his beginnings in Wales and, uh, and Shoreditch, East London, etc was definitely his uh, early stomping ground and still continues to be in the world of street art. This gentleman has uh, amassed a, a huge catalogue of what can only be described as burners. Uh, and, uh, Barry Burners. <laughs> Barry Burners, <laughs> exactly. Jim Vision in the place. How are we? Really good, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, man. I always, um, I always get a little bit struck, you know, because when you see the visuals of characters like yourself create on such a grand scale and then to uh, be humbly met by you and uh, and uh, you know it's almost like the detachment of the art to the artist and th th that <clears throat> really shines through particularly with you my friend thanks very much buddy i mean can i just say it's incredible to be here thanks so much for having me oh thank you um and i think uh, there's definitely a disconnect isn't there especially with things like social media mm. you know the character and the artwork that people create mm. and then when you finally meet them and put it all together it's like it's a win. <laughs> it's a win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I guess that's where I was coming from, in the sense that we often see this uh, this art, particularly from a graph side of things, this huge stature of uh, uh, of a piece, particularly the ones that you do. Um, and uh, without getting into the obvious questions of how long does it take and what you know, what's the what's the paint, what's the type, but you know, it's on first impression, just like how the fuck do you even begin to create with perspective mm -hmm. something of that scale? Something massive, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of dedication, you know, you really have to be focused and you really got to, you really got to want it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that want it, in what regard? Well, like, you know, it has to, it has to come from you, doesn't it? You know, nobody's going to paint these walls for you. So, you know, it's got to be like a totally self-driven mission that you're on. I'm going to paint these massive walls. Mm. I'm going to go on the side of a building. We're going to jump straight into it. How does that headspace begin? Like, if you're, if you're scaled to the sketch and you're looking at the size of the wall, or like, how do you proportion that? Well, I mean, I think like we, I, I started off doing a lot of graffiti and a lot of like characters, so everything is always about proportion. You know, that's I think that's like my superpower. My superpower is proportion. Mm -hmm. I can put something on a wall and I can pretty much nail it first off and obviously with the new techniques and new skills that we've got like going way bigger is a lot easier mm. um, and if you want to cheat you can just stick a projector on if you're doing like a client job but really you've got to know how to do this mm. on your own you mm. know nobody's going to do it for you mm. so there is the projector aspect hey i mean i think if you're doing something that has to look exactly the same you can use a projector it's not cheating but when you're doing your own thing you just got to get on with it when you well, this isn't, you know, this isn't a trade that you can just, you know, jump straight into, you know, balls deep. Yeah. Um, wh where did it start for you? Like, how do we get to this place where Jim Vision is now? Well, I mean, OK, I think first off, you know, I'm just a massive fan of culture, of art, of like pictures, uh, movies. So, like, I think like I spent my formative years like just like 
devouring comic books and manga and mm. watching movies. So my head is just filled with all of this stuff. And I think when I was younger, it was a lot more violent and kind of action-based. Mm -hmm. And as I get older and I'm a more relaxed person, it's mm -hmm. a bit more serene and a bit more relaxed. But, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just filling myself with comic books. I'm constantly reading that stuff. Really? And, Inspiring myself from all of these different illustrators and artists. So what was it? What was the cartoons that were Ren and Stimpy and things like well, that? Well, I mean, obviously Saturday morning cartoon mm. really like started me off. You know, like waking up at five o'clock in the morning. You know, when the C-Fax is still rolling and you're like, I'm too early. I'm, <laughs> it's not. God damn it! Isn't too early. Yeah. And then, like as I got older, you know, things like 2000 AD. You know, like Judge yeah. Dredd really like twisted my head a little bit. Yeah. And then uh, when I went to America, when I was about eight or nine, you know, discovering the X-Men early '90s X-Men was Whoa. just like totally mind blowing yeah. for me. What about the like the kind of Chuck Jones, like Warner Brothers era? Yeah, kind of I mean, I'm kind of into that kind of cartoon stuff, but I kind of left that behind. Yeah. I was kind of really going towards the more mature stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, the Spider-Mans and the Superman. Yeah, and like Akira and Ghost in the Shell and stuff. Oh, and oh, yeah. I know, I watched that way too young, so my mind was just totally like, whoa, what is this ultra-violence crazy Ak Akira shit? for me, I mean, that first that first scene, that that first moment where you dragged into this, you know... Sin City, mm -hmm. apocalyptic uh, future of of cityscape, and for me it was like, yo, like everything's black. Yeah, yeah. How are you animating everything in the dark? And um, yeah, everything is at night time, isn't it, at the beginning? Yeah. And it's got that amazing soundtrack. It's like, chuk, 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 and it's like really like moving everything forwards. It's like, yeah. yeah, it like gets you right in the heart, doesn't it? it? Really does. Well, it captures you. You know, it's like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. It's like, well, you're never looking back now. You're watching... Yeah, you're fully day. in there, yeah. yeah fully in. Mm. Um, so, uh, Barry, big up the Barry crew, big up big up Wales, <laughs> um, big up Cardiff and Swansea, for that matter, why not? Um, you're holding flags and doing amazing jobs over there, you know. That's so good, big up the crew. <laughs> uh, where did... Where did Graf begin for you? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that uh, Graf started in Wales for me. I mean, my art teacher gave me a bunch of books with graffiti and that kind of, like, opened my mind to it. But um, I dev didn't really get properly inspired until I came to London and I kind of was surrounded by it. Mm. You know, every single train line is covered in graffiti. We, uh, I was in Bow and Shoreditch was just covered in paste. Now you come to mention it, there is a lot of graffiti around. There was a lot there? of graffiti, yeah. <laughs> so, like, that for me was just like this kind of like the blinkers are open, mm. you know, like coming from a small town in Wales, you don't see all of that culture, you don't really understand what's going on. So, and how old were you at that time? When I was like uh, 21, I came to London. 21, yeah. yeah. Green. Green, totally just like, what the hell is all of this stuff? <laughs> the doors are open, yeah. and like, what is happening? There's a Particularly with cities like London, there definitely is a pecking order. There's seat, there's places at the a table. Hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How on earth did you get in a position where? Well, I don't think I got let in. If that makes sense. Like when I turned up, the definitely the doors were closed, and I was kind of like very much on the outside looking in. Mm. But I think sometimes that kind of inspires you to work a bit harder, doesn't it? You know, mm. coming from somewhere else, mm. not understanding the London mentality. Mm. And just go, well, how the hell am I going to fit into this? Mm. Where's my position in this whole thing? Mm. So, um, you know, after a few years of practicing and getting better at graffiti and street art, um, I started organizing events at the Dragon Bar. Do you ever go to Dragon Bar? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, in the room upstairs, we, like, put on loads of events, and we got sponsored by Tiger Beer. They gave us, like, literally cases of beer. So I got everyone drunk. I brought the whole community together. Wow. Put everybody up. You know, showing respect to all of the older generation, but also helping out the next generation, and like it for me, it was like bringing everybody together in one place. Wow! You know, and like you say, putting faces to names. Yes, yeah, so who was there in, in that? In well, I mean, we had Inky, I mean Aztec, people like Insa and um, Will Barris. You know, mm. so like literally people from across across the board, all the people smashing it. Wow! Well, that's a, that was a, that was a sweetener. It, yeah, I mean, that was kind of like almost like our introduction to the whole like organizing things, like making things happen. Because like, I knew I was kind of destined to do more than just do some paintings. Like I have this like drive and ability to actually make things happen. Mm. So we, uh, you know, after going and traveling to Germany and learning about meeting of styles, we were like, this is how you're supposed to do a graph jam. You know, in, in England, like, there's a tendency for everyone just to paint their pieces next to each other, which is fine, that's cool. But in Germany, they get organised and they, like, put proper productions on, like, everyone's got the same colour schemes, mm -hmm. everyone's working towards a common goal. And I was like, this is what we need to do in London. It's funny you say that. There was always something about the 
the German scene, the Parisian scene of that time, it was almost like they were they had such a huge global presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And f from from my perspective outside looking in, it felt like the UK, London more predominantly... Was beh yeah. lagging behind. Not, not so much lagging behind, but they, they were anti... Uh, Anti-organisation. Organisation. Maybe that's what it is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, I, I, on, on balance, I, I think that is where other creative flows and aspects come in that probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have even been thought of by other countries. Yeah. Um, and L London has that aggressive slant, similarly to like a New York or a Toronto yeah, or yeah. Philly, you know. But in places like France and Germany, like it's a, it's like praised. It's like wow, this is amazing culture. In this country, you're like kind of subjugated and pushed down. Like this isn't mainstream culture. This is the other stuff. But who pushes that down? Well, I mean, I think there is like an oppressive force from you know the the establishment, isn't there? Yeah, there is. You know, like we're we're kind of treated like illegal artists, aren't we? Yeah. You know, oh yeah, that's just illegal. It's like this isn't just illegal. This is a human expression. That's the rhetoric. That's the rhetoric. That's what we have to overcome before we even get to zero. You know, we're already behind that we're trying to push forwards. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in places like France and Germany, they celebrate these artists. They go, wow, look at Mo Two had to go to Paris, you know. Yeah, that's right. Just to have a proper career. And more recently, we've seen the Metalheads. That's right. Full scale production. In Bristol. Do you think that, um, <clears throat> do you think that those sorts of things, I mean, they've got to resonate with the establishment to, 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 to a do you think? Degree. Do you think it's painful for the establishment when they see us get organised and then we do so, such good stuff and they're like, oh, those guys? I, th I think, <laughs> good, good question, I think some of it is divide and conquer, don't you? I mean, Absolutely, you know, yeah. And that's the attitude that's always been, mm -hmm. you know. Just if you can kind of put everybody, pitch everyone against each other. You know, you're like in graffiti. Sometimes it feels like everyone's fighting each other. Mm. But if we got organised, imagine how powerful that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if it was a organised confusion, this totally. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying one person be in charge of everything. It's not mm. like some kind of dictatorship. That's never going to work with graffiti. But if we all just said, right, we're going in this direction, mm. we're going to take over London. Mm. <laughs> we're going to take over all the walls. Yeah. So you've got some tears and things that you. You've got your fingers in pies with. So, oh, yeah. so there's an agency side of things. There's the production mm -hmm. corporate side of things. There's the more pleasurable doing sure. your own things. But break down that. Break down the headspace for that. How does that even work? I mean, I think I've always kind of had to have all of these different hats that I wear, like mm. depending on which, you know, what day it is. And obviously I love painting for myself, but um, I also love painting for, you know, computer games, film companies, comic books, yeah. cartoons, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's that's, nice to get paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, no, it's nice to get paid. Yeah. Um, and plenty of people do it uh, uh, under the radar. Don't oh, they? yeah. Well, I mean, I think like what we're seeing at the moment is like this kind of resurgence, or maybe not resurgence, but like this drive to kind of get graffiti and street art into the mainstream. And then, you, you know, because artists kind of almost were reticent to kind of push it into that field, we have all these other like middlemen and people come in and say, oh, well, you don't have to worry about it. We'll do it for you. Mm. And of course, <clears throat> you know, they're just taking 50% of your pay cut, you know. Mm. So I think the most important thing is for artists to be independent and push it forwards themselves. So that's like, that's always been our position is like, we're just doing it ourselves. We're not gonna wait for someone to like, give us an olive branch and say, oh, here you go, here's your seat at the mm. table. We're just gonna make the table and we're gonna get our own seats and we're gonna do it ourselves. <laughs> there's the war cry right there. <laughs> um, you're right about the, the, the push for something new in, in mm. what is the contemporary art world, isn't it? Yeah, and I think like it's really easy for like corporate, some corporate type people to just immediately like push it towards selling some products. Yeah. So that's like that's really like taken away from our culture. Mm. You know, that's not embracing our culture and giving it like wings to grow. That's mm. just saying, oh, why don't you come over here and sell some products for our corporate clients? Mm. That's all bullshit. Like, let's try and stay away from that shit. But mm. if you've got clients who are like, you know, we're supporting you. We want to we want to see what your creativity can do. That's exciting for me. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, there's also the aspect of, because deeper than that, there is the, the, the magpie picking of things that, you know, institutionally, they're all right. They ain't the tags. Yeah, yeah. Um, which we personally love. But that is the, that is their prerogative, isn't it? And then through that avenue of cherry picking the right people, then all of a sudden they get these other people, which is like, well, you, they ain't nothing to 
They're not going to do the cold yet. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many people have you seen, like, making pieces of art with, like, a, a Disney character with a splash of paint and, like, this is a street artist. This is not a street artist. Right. This is just some guy trying to sell some shonky canvases. Yeah. Um, Shoreditch, and this is no way a loaded question, um, so, you know, answer however you will. But Shoreditch and uh, East London as a whole has, has kind of become this ever-evolving canvas that does allow, you know, anyone they want to come in and do whatever they feel like doing mm. and kind of getting away with it. And I say that because there's people out there that, whether it's graph or bona fide street art or people like yourself that, that deal with production in collaborative ways mm. that don't... I mean, that can't sit well. Like Shoreditch at the moment is just is filled with a lot of graffiti tourists, you know, people who come from other places, have a little quick walk around, tag on all the murals, like, and then they're off and they're like, I've done my job. And it's like, you've just destroyed all these people's pieces of art. Mm. It's what's happening. It's kind of just keeps going around. It's like a cycle. Mm. But I think, like, so Shoreditch is a really interesting area, isn't it? Because it's always been almost like a, you know, like a crossing point for so many people. Mm. It's like the centre of East London culture. Mm. It's like a place where artists and musicians notoriously would kind of congregate and make things happen. Mm. Uh, and now what we have is kind of like the property developers who've come and just wiped all of that out by buying up all the things, gentrifying, gentrifying mm. everything and building new buildings. Mm. Um, and so what have we got left? We've still got these walls, but, mm. you know, the culture's kind of been destroyed a little bit. Do you think that's a process that... Um Building developers and councils. Do, do you think they use graph and and the more c creative uh, communities <clears throat> to leverage that kind of behaviour? Absolutely. I mean, I think they're almost looking at where the next thing is going to be. Where is the artists and musicians kind of go next? Mm. And then as soon as they something pops up, like in Peckham or Tottenham, it's like cool. We'll just jump all over that, mm. buy up all the cheap land build our massive buildings and by that point the artists have all been pushed out and the, the warehouses have all been shut down but from a graph point of view do you think because my my interpretation of it is the more damage that can be made with graph mm. the the more organic that will that 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 will it will speed up that process well i think like the uh Graffiti artists have always kind of gone in places where people don't really necessarily want to be. You know, yeah. they're like they're down the back alleys, they're in spots so they can like have a nice paint. Um, and so those kind of places, eventually, you know, you get a coffee shop and mm. like people start coming there and people start doing nicer pictures. Or the Dragon walls. Bar or something like that. Or Dragon yeah. Bar, like anything happens and that, that kind of like just turns up the, the volume, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Mm. Um, it's a process that's happened in many bar boroughs, you know, from the 60s and 70s. Oh, yeah, the King's Road and... Yeah. All the way through. Yeah, it's going to keep happening. Yeah, and I think like I don't know if you've been to Wynwood or you've been to Miami. Um, yes, I have. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, I mean like that, that is an example of how the shortageification effect mm. can happen in a really short space of time. In like ten years, it went from being you know a really dangerous place to be, full of warehouses, mm. loads of graphers painting on walls, mm. to being totally gentrified, massive big condominiums, mm. all of the art is sterile and kind of approved, and they have to go through processes. Uh, and then, and people are kind of owning all of this wall space, owning these big buildings, and in turn owning owning the art. Yeah, and like people paying money to literally paint walls is insane. That's crazy. Yeah. But from a from a not council, whatever whatever that is in the states, the commitment there, at least, <laughs> is proof, isn't it? Yeah, it's proof. It's proof of the power of our culture. Yeah. That you can like literally take a warehouse district full of graph, mm. and it can become probably one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in the U in America. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. That being said, though, and looking at it from a UK standpoint, I think what the powers at beef fail to understand is if you're constantly redeveloping the areas and places... And pushing the artists out. And yeah, where writers paint, then they're only escalating the bigger trouble that they don't want to be faced with. Well, they're just moving people into different areas and, like, that area will now become the new spot and then, yeah. you know, that will be covered in graph. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And then it will expand into other areas where they don't like the tags. They don't like the, it's yeah, madness. and there's less police and there's less paying attention to that stuff. So, you know, I think at the moment, I would say we're in, like, a really sweet spot where, you know, 
people painting walls, people doing productions are killing it, and people doing illegal graph are killing it as mm -hmm. well. So it's like a double whammy. You know, all sides of the culture are totally nailing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen more trains running than ever before, which is amazing. That's crazy as well. Mm. Uh, that's a security thing, isn't it? Really? That's a fine, that's a that's a money thing. They ain't got it's that. a money thing, yeah. They, they ain't got the funds. They can't chase everybody. No, but they should be giving them diplomas, some sort of you know certificate <laughs> at university, you know, for for tackling their security issues. Really, yeah, yeah. Give Fine them an art holes. degree. That was fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm condoning it. We don't do any of that on this podcast. It's a nice little story, you understand. <laughs> um, but you do events as well, crazy production events. That's right. Yeah, so we've been doing meeting of styles for like the last uh, 15 years, and we've done about 10 events. That's mad. I know, and, the, and they have been like some of the biggest graffiti jams in London. Yeah, who have you had them? Hoover had along. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think my favourite crew was the French crew Mental Vapors. Do you know the Mental oh, Vapors? I've heard the name. Bomb K, right. Jaw. Those guys totally smash it. Wow. Yeah, and they're doing these massive characters, and it's just some of the sickest stuff you've ever really, seen. Really, really. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else we can? I mean, everybody has come through at some point. You know, so many of the the best artists. So it's have come a brand. Through. It's a brand. Yeah. Making styles, are, of course. You yeah, know. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, it literally is happening all over the world. And I would say what's happening in Taiwan and Indonesia and all those places, you know, it's like that art culture is kind of shifting. And now those guys who've got pretty young fledgling graffiti cultures are now having their meeting styles and they're killing it as well. Yeah, that is insane, and that influence again perpetuated by social media and mm -hmm. you can see anything at any given time exactly it's literally as soon as the event happens the pictures are up up uploaded and you can see it all from a street art point of view does that create make the landscape linear you know with it with going back to what we we're saying about the london style and that the anti mm. the antithesis of what may be happening in Korea or Australia or not Australia but you know Korea or Germany you know with the bigger productions do you think it do you think it flattens the the, the land and in some ways sanitize the impact I think you've pretty much nailed it that's exactly what social media is doing it's uh, it's sanitizing the art form you know if you look at these big mural festivals and you really kind of break it down. You know, they're obviously trying to be more diverse with the artists that they have on there. But by being diverse, they're kind of choosing the same artists. Yeah. So it's not really yeah. that diverse. It's really just the same artists, like, in different countries. And they're all kind of painting the same thing. It's totally safe. It's totally sanitised. Nothing that's challenging the status yeah. quo. Yeah. Uh, lots of people holding pot plants. I don't know what that's about, but it's what's a the thing. Way you're saying? Hold on, <laughs> yeah. pop, plant, pop plant gate. What's the what's pop plant about? It's just loads of like photorealism of like people holding a plant and kind of looking, you know, a bit kind of emotionless at the at the viewer. And you're like, what? What am I supposed to get from this? Like, what's the point of this painting? That's some dumb shit. It's just what happens. And I think, uh, you know, when you have all this money involved and when you have all of these councils giving mm. approval, they kind of expect it to not challenge anything. They don't want anything that's going to talk about climate change or talk about, you know, diversity or you know, any of the big topics yeah. that we really need to be talking about as artists. They're kind of just squashed and they're kind of like, we're not talking about that. We don't want anything mm. that's going to make anybody feel anger. We want safe. We want, we want safe. Yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of like, I'm kind of steering away from... Uh, paint festivals if I can unless like something really kind of grabs my attention and it's exciting I'd much rather just go and paint a wall for myself and do what I want to do it's funny I was talking to um, a couple of drum bases I won't indulge in the names I'll sort of spoil the podcast for you <laughs> but uh, that social media dilemma also works in the raves mm -hmm. there's also a problem there it's as happening well. across the board yeah okay same lighting up on yeah. the bills and all of it is driven on 46 second videos sure and how popular how many how yeah. many likes you got on social media yeah you know i'm not chasing social media so it's not something that i've been trying to drive the numbers up you know i just post a picture and then i leave it but um i know there's loads of people who are desperate to try and get these social media numbers but at the expense of like making really great art mm. you know because they're just trying to find something that people like who cares what people like I mean, yeah. that's not important is it no 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 there's always an, almost a, a hidden agenda for anyone getting excited about sending their numbers up. Yeah. Well, to what end? It doesn't mean anything, does it? It's, no. it's like social media is... I think we've got to get away from social media personally. I think like we have to try and do stuff in the real world. Yeah. So that's why I'm trying to focus more on just existing and doing amazing stuff in the real world. Yeah. Social media is not exciting, is it? Mm, no. And also, it's, it's kind of a fast track for people to get fame when they don't deserve it. No, I've seen that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's us. Uh, um, when you say the real world, you're, uh, <laughs> the, 
the real world is changing mm-hmm. in the event of AI and all these, you know, we're aging our podcast here by even <laughs> in saying such things. But when is that human touch, when is that removed? When, at what point is um, a piece so well done mm. or... So sanitized, so perfectly yeah, yeah, rounded. Yeah. yeah. When do, I guess that's subjective to the art. When, like, when someone discovers it, the art mm. continues to go on. Um, or when you discover like an XL tag or a mean tag just in the bunker of some old disused car park, and mm-hmm. that art takes a fucking new life, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in this age of technology, the lines are blurred, aren't they? Absolutely. And at some point, like everybody's going to be making exactly the same art, and it's going to be. I mean, you have kind of seen it with some some of the graph letters that you see around. It's like they're all they're a London style. I mm. would say there's a London style for sure. And everyone's kind of doing these big chunky blocky letters. But I am seeing a lot more colour and a lot more funky fills, and that's amazing to see because that's kind of where I exist in the world, you know. Mm. So I'm I'm proud to see all of this amazing colour happening in people's letters because they never it used to just be chrome and blacks, mm-hmm. but now we're getting all these crazy colour combinations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Was that one of the things that was on your kind of mission hit, brief when you like hit list because that was definitely that era oh yeah yeah there wasn't it was it was more i guess i guess you'd argue it was probably 50 50 that there was as many chrome and blacks as there was color. yeah i mean i think because i didn't really kind of get invited into the the graph world in that in, of the local london writers mm-hmm. i kind of had to go different ways and yeah. i kind of ended up painting with all the immigrants all the people who were kind of like coming to london all the outsiders all the outsiders and you know those guys generally did something totally different and use loads of different colours. But when you say INSA, I'm, I'm also thinking Aztec, I'm thinking Tizer. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, guys that champion from London. Freestyle. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and... I mean, Tizer's yeah. like a freestyle master, isn't he? I mean, all that stuff is coming straight off the top of his head. Yeah, yeah. You don't know where he's going to go next. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't know where he's going to go next. No, no. It's How amazing. does that even begin to... G- <laughs> Big up Tizer. How does that even happen? <laughs> That's well, I think crazy. like some people are naturally born with this, this gift, you know, like mm-hmm. it's just in them, isn't it? And they just have to create and they have to keep doing it. And if you keep putting bits of paper there, they'll keep filling them up. Mm. Um, I feel like I had to learn my skills, like I had to become a better artist. And so one of the ways that I le- had to learn how to become a better artist is by looking at illustrators and comic book artists and going, how the hell are these guys making this amazing art? And mm-hmm. I kind of, I definitely copied a lot of stuff in the beginning just to kind of understand the lines mm. and the paint techniques and all that stuff. And then I tried to apply it to my graffiti and street art. Wow. Uh, so what's the what's the work rate for you at the moment, Jim? What's the- well, I mean, I would say I'm very casual at the moment because I've got a three-year-old daughter who's taken up most of my time. Uh, but um, That's the real art right there. That is the good stuff. <laughs> the art of survival. <laughs> the art of survival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm always creating stuff, but really in between looking after a child and kind of living in London. Well, there's just so many heads you have. Yeah, you just have to keep kind of switching your hat, don't you? And be like, right, I'm this, today I'm doing this and next day I'm doing that. Yeah. Okay, so for the layman's, because I know you get asked this a lot, but we're going to clear air on this. <laughs> What's the process of, uh, of doing a piece of, of such a grand size? I mean... What's the average amount of paint? What's the average amount of time? And what are the stumbling blocks? Well, um, you know, usually it takes me about a day to, like, do my design, get all the colours in and just get it right. Then you have to kind of work out all the different colours that you're going to need for that piece. Yeah. And the bigger you go, just bring more paint, you know. You'll use it all. You'll use it all. Um, We've got a really great wall on Grey Eagle Street. I don't know if you've seen that by Truman Brewery. Yeah, I have, yeah. It's such a beautiful wall. It's, like, really tall and it's really long and you can just do great productions on it. Yeah. So we're going to be doing something for Halloween, so come and have a look. Wow, really? Jeez. Yeah, yeah, beginning of November. Yeah, well, this will be out by then, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, and go. check it out. <laughs> Yo, um, how much does it cost? It's expensive. Paint? paint is expensive. Yeah. You know, and it just keeps getting more expensive with Brexit and all of these different things, yeah. importing costs are kind of changing everything. But, um, you know, I have a really good supply of paint. Like, my garage is full. Really? So it's like whenever I need a colour, I've got something there. Man. Yeah, that must be... I mean, big up Matilda, that must be a one hell of a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to go to the garage while I'll see you in two weeks, you know what I mean? Like, just picking out colours. Just yeah. picking out colours and getting in on it. Mm. Um, anything they ever told you, or never told you, about coming into London that you just weren't prepared, prepared for? I mean, I was just not prepared for the scale of things. You know, it, London is massive, you know, and I'm pretty sure I still haven't explored all of it. I guess that's why I'm kind of not 
inspired to be an all-city king. You know, I'm not trying to get around every single neighbourhood and paint everywhere. Mm. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's amazing how many people are here and how many people are painting. And mm. I would say the culture at the moment, like I say, is, is the best it's ever been. And that's in part because of all the guys coming from other countries and kind of really making the culture interesting, you know, stirring the pot. Yeah, you go to Stockwell and it's just like, wow. Like, full of different people from know, different half bangers. of these writers, it's fucking incredible. And they're from everywhere, yeah. yeah. They wake up at like 7.30 in the morning and they black mulch fucking everything. They're on it, yeah. Um, so that's the thing I love about London is like, you know, how diverse it is, like people from every background. Um, and I f hopefully I feel like, you know, it's a lot more accepting of all these different people. Mm. Whereas in other places there, it kind of shut it down a bit here. We really kind of allow people to exist. Mm. Do you think some of the space could do with... Oh, it's a controversial one, <laughs> if ever I've thought of it. Uh, less productions. How do you mean less production? Like less organisation? No, uh, more, more so chaos. from a from a space point of view, and you know, if people just want to get up and do mm. their thing, it's like, okay, we've all got to level up. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but some sometimes you know, just an individual piece, you know, a nice piece, three or four hours. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes there isn't. Stockwell as an example, you know, just turns over in yeah, a day. You yeah. don't actually get the chance to a have the adequate space because of the well, productions and B, it'd be up for like an afternoon. Maybe someone painting over you as soon yeah. as you leave. Well, I think like in that instance, if you're looking for something to last, you're going to have to find your own walls, aren't you? You have to go out, find a wall, claim it, make it your own. Mm. Uh, and then if someone comes and tags on it, you have to paint over it and kind of, you know, keep, you know, maintain that spot. Mm. Um, so I think like, you know, I definitely, there was a, a turning point in my career where I just said, I'm not doing Hall of Fames anymore because I'm sick of everything just getting painted over all the time. Mm. And I just started scouring Shoreditch and different places, like finding a wall that I could paint. So I've probably got about 10 running at the moment in Shoreditch. What, hidden locations kind of out off the beaten track? Yeah, just, just like a back road or a street over there. And like, it's not the main street, so people don't necessarily want to paint it. But for me, it's perfect because I can have a nice paint. You need some sort of sat nav map app for yeah, your yeah. pieces. There. <laughs> That's crazy. What's the cr what's the what's the most grandeur uh, place you've ever painted or had to travel? You to? mean grandeur or like the coolest? I think both actually. What's okay. the what's the most craziest, unfathomable in your head? Well, I mean, I've got a few. Um, I painted in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Have you been to Buenos Aires? Right. That city is insane. Like, it's it's super fast-paced, it's dirty, it's like, it's like loads of people crammed together. It feels like a bit European, but also very South American. Uh, and they gave me a massive wall, I painted a gigantic horse on it. Yeah? Yeah, it was crazy. For, it was a meeting of styles, and uh, I had no idea what to expect. I thought I was just going to paint a little wall, and they were like, yeah, that... That's your wall there, and it's literally like ten stories with a massive lift. Oh, what's your <clears throat> hold on? What's your take on that? As soon as you see something like that that you weren't prepared for? Well, I mean, obviously you just you just like <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. and then you just have to get your head into it. But I'm, um, you know, I totally smashed it. And how <clears throat> do you get your head nuts? See, this is the bit that I think the untrained, the people that are just you know happen to walk past in one of those you know street art you know <laughs> tourist um, walkabouts. And they see something like that, and you're just cracking on with it. It doesn't, on surface, appear that you, you know you look like you know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, I make it look easy. Yeah. That's my, that's always my plan. Is like, how easy can I make this look? That's the best. That's the best writers. Yeah, yeah. Artists. And then, uh, and then the other best spot that I painted was a a, a scrap plane in South Wales. Yeah, I saw that. That's fucking. So cool. it was a seven four seven gigantic plane. I had a, I had a lifter and a cherry picker, and they were just like, yeah, you got, you just crack on, go for it. They're just going to scrap the plane anyway, so they were like, they weren't bothered about me painting it. And uh, literally had the biggest cherry picker that I've ever been in in my life, and I still couldn't quite reach the very top. Really? Yeah, it was so big. That's insane. I mean, you ever done a plane before? It was windy. It uh. was, it was so windy. Like I was literally at full extension on this cherry picker and the whole thing is moving like this just hanging onto the wing just like, holding on the the mm. the tail of the plane is kind of moving in the wind as well so like as i'm painting it it's like moving away from me so i'm having to like just totally change my position so i mean you know in the background there you know the the the, heck, the heckling <laughs> the heckling uh yeah um voice of uh, of matilda there you guys work together I would say so you know what you've done now. So now you 
I mean, I would say Matilda's like my boss. You know, she's the only person who can boss me around, tell me what to do. Yeah. You know, I'm very anti-authority, so she's well, she's the only one who can tell me what really? to do. Really? What's that like working in a relationship? It's, I mean, it's, it has its challenges, but I think because we have like a shared mission and we're kind of in it together, mm. you know, it kind of makes the bond stronger and it makes us work better. We can only go one or two ways. I was in a relationship where I was working together, and that went uh, more south than uh, uh, than um, yeah. You have south to Pole. you have to like leave your ego behind a little bit, don't you? And kind of know that we're like we're trying to work together to make this happen. Yeah, and also delegation and trust. All of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not easy. No, it's not. But then it's not easy in any working environment. People's. You know, I would say like working nine to five would be harder. Harder, I agree. Than working for yourself to try and make your mission come to life. It's just behaviour, isn't it? People it behaviour. You need to have like dedication and you need to have like um, de determination to make these things happen. Yeah. Because as soon as you just stop doing it, it's not like something magical is going to happen and it happens for you. Yeah. You know, it's like with graffiti. Like graffiti doesn't care if you stop doing graffiti. It mm -hmm. just goes cool. Mm -hmm. There's more people doing graffiti. Mm -hmm. You know, it just keeps on happening. So, you know, you just have to stay relevant, do you? Yeah, something Tizer said to me once, and I think I've cited it before on podcast. He, he, he said, you know, the city doesn't need any of us. No. It doesn't need it any... It doesn't want us, really. No, <laughs> it really doesn't want us. Yeah. Do you think that's just... Do you think that's across the board, not just art? Well, I mean, I think times are changing, and I think the younger generation see what we're doing, and they see it as, like, a legitimate art form. Mm. And I think the older generation see it as, like, an illegitimate art form. Like, we shouldn't be allowed to do it. Like, you're not supposed to be doing that. So you think that... Because yeah, there are a bunch of young writers out there, massive respect, big up yourselves, you know who you are. But you're suggesting that perhaps it's a, it's an, it's a more... Graffiti might be seen as a more aged culture. I mean, I think there is a lot of amazing artists about 30 or 40 years old, like, totally smashing it. And hopefully there's, a, like, a new generation coming up, but it's it's not as many as our generation. Mm. But um, I think definitely when our generation get to be in control of things, like, we're going to see a change in culture. You reckon? Yeah, I think, I, put it. I think our generation hasn't been given a chance to be in charge. Like, it's the older generations are really, like, holding on to everything, aren't Hold they? the reins. Hold, even, like, the fine art. Uh, you know, when you talk about the art world, mm. you know, do you, does it feel like the art world is not really representative of people? It's kind of really just a rep institution. Yeah, it's like an institution which really only like celebrates a few rich artists mm. and say these are the ones. Damien Hirst isn't he like the rubbishest eyes you've ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> he's a, well, he's a, he's, a, he's subjective. That's for sure. He's, he's very he? successful, but it's rubbish. It's just like I mean, that's not stuff I want to have on my wall. Yeah. Like, but then you see all these amazing graffiti artists and they're kind of subject, you know, you know, pushed down and not allowed to, f to flourish. They're not given, you know, museum exhibitions. They're not put in these big galleries, you know. But in America, you see that change because that is actually their culture. They don't have the same culture in th as this country where, which dates back hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. So the new culture, the new art stuff, that is their culture. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I wonder if Damien Hirst suddenly grabbed a spray can, whether he would be received by the art world <laughs> as be a toy? the next... Uh, well, yeah, well, yes, be a yes, toy. but the, the, the point I'm, I'm getting to yeah. is perhaps he... Would they allow it if he came through? I mean, it does feel like the art world kind of lets in a few people like this, like, oh, Banksy, you're, you're successful, you can come in. Right. You know, you people, you can come in. Basquiat, you know, you can come in. You know, they really only select a few people to come in and say, this is worth anything. Nothing else is worth anything. Mm. Do you think there's a course though? Like, <coughs> if there was a writer that was doing it right from the beginning, could they achieve the dizzying yeah. height of being an art world yeah. babe? And how could you come from graph and end up on top of the art world? Yeah, and a few few people do it, but there, it's also like you see, like you say, it's not seen as a. It's just seen differently, isn't it? Mm. And I think that's an industry dilemma. Yeah, how do we make, you know, the graffiti industry like actually be representative of the graffiti artists that are in it? I think that is the biggest challenge. It is a big challenge. I mean, I think it's really easy for fine artists to like go to art school, yeah. learn a bunch of techniques and then just like come straight into the graffiti street art culture yeah. and be really good at art and be like immediately on mural line Only if you cut it. And then that's the thing because they come from a, a, an art background. Yeah. So it's almost like... Um, they paint pot plants and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, they paint pot plants. 
But there's a lot of people as well looking at like Basquiat and people like that and going, oh, let's just take that style. There's a whole bunch of new like abstract people basically copying Basquiat. What do you think of that? Well, I think just leave it be. Like he nailed it the first time around. You don't need to see it again. Yeah, that's true. It does. Plagiarism is a very fine line. Yeah, but we got we we need to see new art. Like that's that's what I'm craving. I'm always looking for new art. Like what? Who's doing it differently? What's who's... the what's the newest what's the newest thing that you're seeing at the moment? Whether it's a genre or or well, artist. I mean, there's one artist who I think is totally smashing, and that's uh, Soffles. Do you know Soffles? No, 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 no. Wow. I mean, he's he's literally blowing up. He's totally smashing it really? i mean his his work turnover is insane he's like a machine you know wow he's like painting all of these amazing walls they're gigantic so and it's all off the top of his head you can see him just like just painting not you know it's when you're just looking at your picture it's different to when you just paint i'm definitely gonna do my research on this that's yeah. crazy well you just well you sound like you've had the privilege of being there well like i say i'm a fan you know so before anything before even i talk about myself like the I'm a fan of the art. I'm a fan of people making stuff. <clears throat> I totally want to encourage everybody to be an artist. Yeah. And I appreciate really good stuff. Mm -hmm. Encourage everyone to be an artist. I think so. I mean, I think, like, there's there's a lot of people who've got psychological problems in this world, mm -hmm. mainly because of, you know, capitalism and the society that we're in. And I think if you're into art, you, you kind of... You can deal with those problems mm -hmm. a lot easier. You know, you can... You can yeah. You can funnel it through your art form or you can just use it as a chance to kind of get away from the thoughts in your mm. head. You know, I think if more people do art, then we're going to have a happier society. How zen are you when you're doing a wall? I mean, I'm totally zen. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's, you know, you're in a moment, aren't you? Just mm. like totally switched off people talking to me and I don't hear them. And then stepping away from... And you're just feeling completely that freedom and liberation. And Absolutely. It's like, you know, your, your whole body is like totally cleansed. Yeah. But there is a lot of people when they do these art tours, they try and like pull you out of this moment. They're like, can you come over here and talk to me? And they always ask the same question, how long did this take? And it's just like, yeah. oh, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they mean no harm, but yeah. they don't know the code. They don't, they don't know it from that side of things, but they also don't know the illegality of it. it means you don't take fucking photos. You know, it's not finished and I shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't have to explain to you why I'm doing this either. Yeah. You know, I'm not just because I'm painting in the street doesn't mean I'm like easy access and you know I'm available. I guess some people like the attention. They, they yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know many of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's weird because like I don't feel like I'm a performer, you know. And you're a performer, so you're always like presenting and like mm. you know expressing yourself like to a big audience. Whereas I don't really feel like I'm much of a performer. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm, it's always a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it's always a challenge. It's the landscape we're <laughs> working. What uh, what can we expect? In the future, Jim. Well, I mean, so we've had a pretty crazy year. We've done uh, we've done jobs for Paramount for uh, the new Bob Marley movie. Wow. And the recent uh, Transformers movie. Wow. So we've got a couple more, like, big productions in the pipeline for some really great brands. And I'm also going to really try and focus on painting some things that I want to paint. Mm. So, like, this production for Halloween and, like, a few few things I've got, you know, cooking in, in the kitchen. What I love about you the most, brother, is that you've got your lane, you love what you do. Absolutely. You're doing it to the fullest. You ain't causing no trouble. You're doing your thing, and uh, you're doing it to the max, and that is an inspiration. Thanks, man. Jim Vision, my brother. <laughs> Great chatting to you. Wicked. Killer Killer Podcast out there was out of fashion, all right? There's some intel there, some vital intel there for you, people. Um, remember, sharing is caring. Uh, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Don't talk to one, and I wouldn't. Take care. Easy. Yeah. Thanks, man. Oh,